Father, we do love you, Lord, and we are always, Lord, so grateful to, to have your word before us. Lord, we recognize that, that these are the words of life, and you provide instruction, Lord God, for, for living today. Lord, your word is truth that exposes the lies, that exposes the error, the deceit that Satan has so, so rapidly, Lord God, influenced this fallen world around us. And so, Lord, help us this morning. I thank you for everyone that's here. I thank you for those tuning in online, recognizing, Lord God, that we recognize our need for you. Your word says we're to seek first the kingdom. That's what we're doing. Lord, you are more important than, than everything else going on, Lord, and that's why we gather together this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, desiring that, that by your spirit, through your word, you would speak to us and you would minister to your people. We need your voice. We need your word. We need to know your truth in these last days. We love you. We thank you this morning, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, good morning. If you have a Bible, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you were not with us last week, let me explain to you that 1 Corinthians 15 is the most important chapter in, in the whole book, okay? And last week specifically, I'm going to touch on briefly what we covered, but I really want to encourage you, and I really mean this, whether you're here or whether you're tuning in online, if you missed last week, Spend some time this week and go back and, and watch it or listen to it, okay? It is, last week is the most important passage in the most important chapter in the whole book. And so if you missed it, it is that important for every Christian, again, to make sure you understand what we covered in the first 11 verses. Now, briefly, chapter 15 is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? That's the focus of this whole chapter, and it is so important that we as believers understand and believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it is Christ's resurrection that separates Christianity from every other religion. We live in a world where they're trying to compare religions, where they're trying to say, well, it's, it's the same God, just a different name. Or all roads lead to heaven. But the reality is that's, that's a lie from the pit of hell because Jesus declared he's the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Amen? No one comes to the Father except through him. He made that crystal clear. Now the question is, why should we believe him? Why can we trust the Bible instead of the Quran or Book of Mormon or, or whatever religious book that people study? And the reason is that the resurrection sets Jesus apart from every other religious leader who ever lived. Why? Well, think about it. Every other religious leader from any religion died and is buried today. Isn't that right? And if you went to their tomb, you would find their, their bones or their ashes still there. But how about Jesus? Is he alive? Did he rise? He's risen indeed, amen? He rose from the dead. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. And that's what sets him apart from everyone else. It is what makes it clear that everything that he said is true. He proved who he is, the Son of God and God the Son, by dying for our sins, conquering the grave, right, and raising from the dead. This is, again, who Jesus is. Now, I love this because this is what brings assurance to our lives that we believe the right thing. But if you were with us last week, and as Paul focused on the importance of understanding and believing the resurrection, what we learned is that our whole faith hinges on the resurrection. In other words, I'll say it this way. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, our whole belief system collapses. Because then he's just like everybody else. Because then Christianity is just like every other religion. And so, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, and he's still dead, then what are we doing here? We might as well throw our Bibles away. Does that make sense? We might as well just go home, just go back to our old sinful lives. Thank God he rose. Amen. That changes everything. And this is what Paul is going to talk about, okay? 
It's not enough just to believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead. You need to understand the impact believing that not only has on our future, praise the Lord, but it also should impact the way we live today. And that's what Paul is going to talk about. He's already proven the resurrection is true. He gave us evidence. I'll recap that in a few minutes. But understanding that should change everything, not only our future, but our present as well. Now, very quickly, let me touch on what we covered. Now, remember, in this book, Paul is answering questions that the believers in Corinth had. And so in chapter 15, it's all focused on the resurrection. Now, the question that we should be asking is, wait a minute. Why were the Christians in Corinth asking about the resurrection? I mean, didn't they already believe in the resurrection? And you would say, of course they did. The only way to become a Christian is you have to believe that Jesus died, was buried, and arose from the dead. And so they already believed in the resurrection. And so why did Paul take the time to address it? And here was the reason. If you weren't with us, this is a little bit of what we covered. Ancient Corinth was in Greece, okay? Primarily Greek. Now the Greeks always followed the beliefs of their ancient Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, so on and so forth. They taught a philosophy that was known as dualism. Dualism. And their belief stated that all matter, everything physical, was evil. The only thing that was good was the spirit. That's what they believed. And so their picture of the afterlife was the spirit or the soul being set free from an evil body. That's what they considered the afterlife. So when Paul came preaching that Jesus rose from the dead in his body, they could not comprehend that because wait a minute, in their minds, the body is evil. There's no way that evil body would rise again. And so they said, there's no way Jesus could have rose from the dead physically. Maybe he just rose from the dead spiritually. Maybe his spirit is only what rose. And so this lie began to spread in the church of Corinth. And they began to wonder, wait, 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 maybe Jesus didn't rise from the dead physically. Maybe it was only a spiritual resurrection. And that began, of course, to confuse and to discourage the believers. And so Paul took the time to address this issue again in this chapter. And we began last week with Paul saying this. Paul told them in verse 3, For I delivered to you when I first came to Corinth, I share with you of first importance. The most important thing that I taught you is, is what I also received. And Paul shared with them that he did not create the gospel. It was not his clever idea. He simply shared with them what he himself had been shared by Christ. What was that? Well, we went on. It's the gospel. Verses three and four, that Christ died for our sins. Let me ask you, did he die for his own sins? He died for our sins. Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life. He died for our sins. He died on purpose. And... He was buried. Was he buried in a tomb? Tomb of Joseph of Arimathea? And he rose again on the third day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Jesus rose again on what we celebrate as Easter Sunday, amen? It's very, very important. That's the gospel. That is what took place. This is the truth of God's word that Paul says, that's what Jesus had shared with me. Now the beauty in this is because Jesus did this, he proved he was Lord of all. He proved that he, again, had conquered sin, death, and the grave, and his resurrection backed up every claim that he made so that we can trust in him. But Paul shared something very important. Notice he says it twice, that all of this took place, you guys see it? In accordance with the scriptures. In other words, was this always the plan of God? Yes. It was written about in the Old Testament that he would 
Die, be buried, and resurrected. I gave you scriptures last week from the Old Testament. All of this was the plan of God. And so how can we trust that Jesus truly did rise? It was, he was fulfilling scripture. All of this was supposed to happen according to the plan of God. And so now having established that Jesus truly did die, arise from the dead, Paul is going to further explain the resurrection. And as I mentioned, again, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. It is important not only that we believe the resurrection occurred in the past. Write that down. It's important that we not only believe the resurrection occurred in the past, but we also need to understand that believing the resurrection impacts our future and it should impact our present as well. And that is exactly what Paul is going to teach in our study this morning. If you're taking notes, the focus is on the resurrection of the dead, okay? The resurrection of the dead. Paul's going to explain how the resurrection or believing in the resurrection changes everything. Again, it changes our past, it changes our future, it changes our present. And the first thing he explains are the implications that would take place if there was no resurrection. What would happen if Jesus never rose? What would happen if Jesus was still dead? And that's what he wants them to consider for themselves. Look at verse 12. Let's pick up right where we left off. Paul says this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed, if Christ is preached, having, that, that he rose from the dead, how can some of you, he's writing to the Christians in Corinth, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Now, I love this, okay? If you were with us last week, Paul gave three proofs. One of them was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. But one of the other proofs is that when you trust in Christ, the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they are brand new. Isn't that, isn't that right? How many of you know that something happens when you put your faith in Christ, you experience that spiritual resurrection? And, and I, I'll tell you, when God saved me, I knew that God saved me. I didn't ha hear God's voice, I didn't see a vision, nothing like that, but you know what? When you experience God do something in your heart, you know that you know that God did something, okay? Now this is important, because Paul is writing to Christians in Corinth that he knew were saved. He knew they had experienced a spiritual resurrection when they put their faith in Christ. Now last week we ended with this verse. Look back, you can look at it in your Bibles, verse 11. Paul says, whether then it was I or they, whether it was me or one of the other apostles, so we preach the gospel that Jesus died, buried, and rose again. And so you believed, Paul said. He's talking to Christians that had believed Jesus rose from the dead. They experienced a spiritual resurrection in their life. And that's why, I look back again in verse 12, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? That's what we shared with you. That's what you believed. That's what you experienced. How now, years later, you're going to start doubting now. Now you're going to you know, start believing those that say maybe Jesus didn't rise physically. Now what's really interesting about this, and again, love the Greek language. The word resurrection that Paul uses here is the Greek word anastasis. It's where you get the female name anastasia. It means resurrection. The word literally means to stand up. That's what the word means. Resurrection means to stand up. And the word describes what? Our bodies that will all one day fall down and die will one day what? Stand up. Pretty simple. That's what the word means. Now let me ask you. Do our souls die or is it our body that dies? Is that pretty simple? And so what's resurrection about? It's about the physical standing up of our bodies that will one day die. Resurrection, in its meaning, describes the physical rising up, not a spiritual. Now they knew this. 
They knew what the word meant, and yet they were allowing themselves to be confused in thinking, well, maybe Jesus didn't die physically. But again, this was always the plan of God, right? That all those that trust in Christ will resurrect just as Jesus prophesied his resurrection. How many of you remember the story of Lazarus, right? John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to Martha, I am the, what? I'm the one who's gonna rise up. That's what he said. And the life, into that newness of life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, they shall live. How many of you love to hear this verse at a funeral? Right? Right? I mean, again, this is one of, when I'm giving a funeral, this is one of the favorite verses I go to because this is what brings hope. This is what gives us that assurance that this life is not all that there is. Because we can stand and trust in the promises of Jesus because he backed it up and know that just as he is the direction, just as he was raised up, one day all those in him will be raised too. Amen? Very, very important. Now, I bring all this up because the sad thing is that they knew what resurrection meant, and yet they allowed themselves to listen to people that were deceiving them into thinking maybe Jesus didn't rise physically. Now, I love what Paul does next because it's the Holy Spirit, no doubt, but it is so amazing how what Paul does next. I want you to think for a second in your own life. I can trust God's word because Jesus backed it up. Amen? That's why we can trust it. But, as I mentioned, what if Jesus never rose from the dead? Let me tell you, I've been to Jerusalem. I I walked inside the tomb, and you know what? No bones there. No ashes. Amen? He's risen indeed. It's very important. But what if there were bones there? What if he never backed up his words, by rising from the dead. What impact would that have on us today? Well, Paul wants them to consider that. He's talking to Christians. He wants them to think about how how dumb their thinking is, how foolish they are to start believing that maybe Jesus didn't rise physically. And so he takes them through hypotheticals to cause them to consider the impact Jesus not having would have on our lives. Look at verse 13. He says, but if, in other words, we know that he rose, but if there is no resurrection from the dead, if no one really rises from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised, right? I mean, if there is no resurrection, if no one ever rises from the dead, that includes Jesus. If no one ever rises, well then, then that would mean not even Jesus rose from the dead. In verse 14, and if Christ has not risen from the dead, then our preaching is in vain. Do you guys understand? All the preaching would be useless. Everything I'm telling you would would be worthless. Why even listen to me? Why even come to church? Why even have a Bible? If Jesus didn't back it up, then why can we trust what he said? Notice, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. That hope you have that one day when you die, you're going to live, that hope you have of raising right into that newness of life and, and being in the presence of God forever, oh, that, that's worthless too because you have no reason to believe that anymore. If Jesus did not rise, look at verse 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we have testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. Paul says, if Jesus never rose, because no one ever rises, like the Greek philosophers say, then Paul goes, then we're just a bunch of liars. Because we've been going around telling everybody that Jesus was raised from the dead. But we've we've been lying. We've been misrepresenting God. So don't even listen to us if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, 
then your faith is futile. Notice the last part. And you are still in your sins. Now that's powerful. Think about what happens if you're still in your sins. Is God holy? Will God let anyone with sin into heaven? No. And so Paul says, you better think about something. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, that means his sacrifice for our sins was not accepted by God, which means he did not provide the forgiveness of anyone's sins, which means we're all still covered with sin. And we will spend eternity without God if Jesus didn't rise. And again, he wants them to recognize the implication if Jesus didn't rise. Look at verse 18. Then those, then everyone also who has fallen asleep in Christ has perished. Paul said everyone out there who's ever lived, who, who, who was a Christian, who trusted in Jesus for their forgiveness of sins, who trusted in Jesus, again, to to grant them eternal life. Well, they're all died, and they're still in their grave. Because if Jesus didn't rise, then then they're certainly not going to rise. Then there's no hope. All those that died, they believed for nothing if Jesus didn't rise. And then he says, verse 19, if in Christ... We have hope in this life only. In other words, if our hope is only good in this life because we have no hope in the next life because Jesus didn't rise, we are of all people to be most pitied. Now, that is such a powerful verse. Let me ask you this question. How many of you would agree with me that being a Christian is hard? Would you agree with that? I'm talking about doing it the right way. I'm talking about wanting sin and being tempted by sin, but telling yourself no and not giving in. I'm talking about, you know, living for Christ and making sacrifices, no longer being able to to live in sin the way you once did, but abstaining, that's hard. How about paying your tithes? Is that hard? Yeah, it's hard. And there are so many things that that God calls us to do as Christians that if we're honest, it's hard to do. But I want you to think for a second that you lived your whole life denying yourself of sin, denying yourself of some of the things that you you wished you could do but you, you give up as a Christian only to find out that none of it mattered. Because Jesus didn't rise after all, and this life is all there is. Now, do you understand how sad that would be? Christians would be the biggest joke in the world. Because everything we did, we did for nothing if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And that's why he said, we are of all people to be most pitied. People should just feel sorry for us because we're a bunch of dummies for giving up all that we have to serve Jesus. Now, that's powerful. Because he wants them to understand just how important the resurrection is and the impact it would have on everything if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Think about it. I'll say it one more time. If he didn't rise, then we can't trust anything he said. Then we have no reason to believe he is God because evidently he wasn't able to conquer the grave and death. We have no Reason to believe we're forgiven of our sins. We have no reason to believe that we will ever spend eternity with God in heaven if Jesus did not rise. And again, this is so important because he wants us, and and especially them, to think through anyone who denies the resurrection because that's the impact it would have on our lives. Let's move on. Second thing. Second thing. First, the implications if there was no resurrection, but the effects of Christ's resurrection because we know that Jesus truly did rise from the dead. Look at verse 20, and this is what Paul says. But in fact, but the truth is, Christ has been raised from the dead. He did rise. He did conquer sin, death, and the grave. 
and he is the, notice what it says, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul keeps using this phrase to describe those who have died. Jesus is the first fruits of those who have died to rise from the dead and never die again. Now what's so beautiful about this passage is you have to understand what Paul is referring to. This is why knowing the Old Testament is so important because all that takes place in the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. And so Paul takes the believers in Corinth back to the Old Testament to remind them of something very, very important. That Jesus, notice, is the first fruits of those who have died. Now what's Paul talking about? Let me explain it to you. It's really, really cool. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were commanded to offer their first fruits to God. Have we heard that before? So, if you were a farmer specifically, and most people were farmers back then, the first portion of your crops, of your grain, before you were allowed to touch it, that first portion was to be grabbed, let's say a handful, was to be grabbed and brought to the temple before God where you would wave it before God, okay? What they would do is they would wave a sheaf of grain. Imagine a small bundle of grain. And they would wave it before God as they offered it to God in thanksgiving. And the beautiful thing, in the same way as we give our tithes, as we give our 10% before God, it is given out of gratitude for God, desiring God accept our offering so that God would accept and bless the 90% of whatever we have. Well, this is that same picture. Jesus is the first fruits. Jesus is that first offering given to God that was accepted by God and in God accepting Christ by rising from the dead, the blessing and acceptance over the rest of the crops happened at the same time, okay? Very, very beautiful. And so here's where it gets interesting. According to the law of Moses, the feast of first fruits, when this was supposed to take place, occurred on the day after the first Sabbath of the day of Passover. Now follow me, this is really important. Jesus died on what day? Friday? He died on Friday? He died on the Passover, you guys with me? He is the Passover lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. Jesus died on Friday. The Sabbath is Saturday the next day. And so the feast of first fruits is the first day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday. What day did Jesus rise from the dead? Sunday. On Sunday. This is important because Jesus is the fulfillment of the feast of first fruits. He was the offering, the first offering given to God that God accepted, right? The first offering of all the harvest. And in God accepting the offering of the harvest, God accepts the rest of the harvest. And so this is the picture. This is the picture so that we understand that in the same way that God accepted Jesus by rising him from the dead, the rest of the harvest is also accepted by God. We are the rest of the harvest. And this is why Paul referred to Jesus as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now keep reading verse 21. For as by a man came death. What man is he talking about? Adam. By a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. What man is that? Jesus, right? He's the God man. Verse 22. For as in Adam... Everyone dies, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ is the first fruits, then at his coming, then when he comes back, those who belong to Christ. 
Now, what's Paul doing? Again, Paul is describing how the resurrection of Christ impacts our future, okay? It impacts the lives of all those who trusted in him. And he does this by explaining to us that because of Adam's sin and disobedience, everyone who is related to Adam experiences sin and the repercussions of sin, which is death, right? Are we all related to Adam? Yes, we are all related to Adam physically by birth. Well, he then goes on. But through another man who lived a perfect, obedient life, everyone related to him by spiritual birth receives the payment for the life that he lived, which is salvation, which is life, right? Which is the resurrection of the dead. Let me ask you this morning, are you only physically related to Adam or are you both physically related to Adam, but spiritually related to Christ. Amen? That's Paul's point. Now, this is the beauty. Those that are in him shall all be made alive. And that's the key. In Christ, those that have put their faith in Christ shall all be made alive. What does he say? But each in his own order. Christ was the first one, right, to be resurrected to life and never to die again. But then, what does he say? Look back, don't forget it. Then at his coming, is Jesus coming back? Yes, he is. He promised he would. You know the verse, John 14, 1 through 3. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I'll come back, that's what he said. And do what? And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. That's the hope we have. Again, Jesus made it crystal clear. Those that are mine, those that have put their faith in me, I'm going first, but I'm coming back for you. Now, what's he describing? Well, he's describing an event that we refer to today as the rapture of the church. Is he coming back for his church? You know he is. Now, Paul would later talk about this event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Beautiful passage. Verse 16, for the Lord Jesus himself, he's coming back himself, will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of, of, the arch, of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. What's he talking about? All the believers who have put their faith in Christ, they have died, right? Those that have died. Let me ask you this question. I want to be crystal clear. Where is their spirit today? Someone say in heaven. Their spirit is not with their dead body in the grave. Is that clear? Their spirit is in heaven with God. But at the moment that Christ returns, right, in the twinkling of an eye, when he comes in the rapture, the dead bodies of all the believers, believers only, are going to be raised. And their dead bodies, whether they're ash, whether they were eaten by sharks, whatever the question might be, right? People always, I've, I've had people ask me, what happened if the person was eaten by a shark? God can figure that out, okay? He's big enough. Their dead bodies are gonna rise and be reunited with their spirit, and they're gonna receive glorified bodies, amen? That happens first. They're first because they died first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be, is that gonna happen? Will be caught up. It's the Greek word harpazo. It's where we get the idea of rapture. We will be raptured up together with them, with their spirits in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with him. Now, I love this verse, powerful verse. It's beautiful, and it's talking about the rapture. Now, someone would say, wait a minute. How do you know this is the rapture? How do you know this is not the second coming of Christ? Because a lot of people want to debate that. Well, real simple. When we read this about the rapture, do you guys notice that Jesus returns for the church, but does Jesus come to the earth? No, he does not. He stays in the cloud. Are you guys with me? 
What happens? We who are in him are caught up to meet with him in the clouds. And then we leave together, back up into heaven, and then there's a seven-year tribulation. You guys with me? Now, when Jesus returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation, is he going to stop at the clouds? No. Zechariah 14 says he's going to come all the way to earth, and he's going to land on the Mount of Olives, the same place that he ascended up into heaven, right, after the resurrection. And so this is a different event. We are talking about the rapture. Now, the beauty in this, and the reason Paul brings this up, is because belief in the resurrection of Christ changes our future. It changes our future, doesn't it? It should cause us, again, to recognize and to have hope in our future. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled all of this stuff, and he backed up everything that he said by rising from the dead. And so if he is the first fruits, we are the rest of the harvest, we are going to join him in heaven. Someone say amen to that, right? I think we need to get excited about that. Now what I love about this, it's kind of really simple. Let me ask you this question. Who is the head of the church? Who's the head of the church? Jesus is the head of the church, amen? He is the head. What does that make us? What are we? We are the body. Does that make sense? Where the head goes, does the body follow? Is that pretty simple? Yes. We're going with him. He was resurrected. We have the hope of one day being resurrected as well. Now, Paul goes on to talk more about the future to explain what else is going to happen, how or, or what else, uh, how else we are impacted by the resurrection of Christ. Look at verse 24. Then comes the end. When Jesus delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and authority and power, for Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. But when it says all things are put under subjection, it is plain that God the Father is accepted who put all things in subjection under Christ. When all things are subjected to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the Father who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all and all. Now, this might be a little confusion, but let me try to simplify it as much as possible. Paul has just described the rapture. Now, let me ask you, those of you that know your book of Revelation, what's after the rapture? Seven-year tribulation? At the end of the seven-year tribulation, Jesus returns in his second coming, amen? Wipes out false prophet, antichrist, uh, right? Um, uh, all the armies, the battle of Armageddon, so on and so forth, book of Revelation, After that, Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom where he will reign on the throne of David for how long? Thousand years, okay? We find this all in the book of Revelation. But is that the end? No, that's not the end. Not if you know your book of Revelation. What happens after that? What's really interesting? You need to remember that there are going to be many people that survive the seven-year tribulation, right? Many people that survive. Now, those people are going to have kids, and their kids are going to have kids. And over that thousand years, there's going to be a whole fresh crop of people that are still alive physically. You guys with me? So what does God do? Well, God, according to the book of Revelation, you can read it, chapter 20, God is going to release Satan one more time. And there is going to be a final rebellion that takes place where these people are going to be tempted by Satan. They must choose for themselves Christ or the world or Satan. And then ultimately what's going to happen, according to Revelation 20 and 21, Christ is going to wipe out Satan for good as he is cast into the lake of fire. And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. You guys with me? Revelation chapter 21. And then once all things are now under the complete 
control and Jesus has defeated death so that there's no more death, Jesus is going to hand it all back to the Father. Why is that important? Because the Father had entrusted everything, all authority, all rule to him, and Jesus is in submission to the Father as he hands it all back to the Father so that, again, the Godhead is glorified in everything that takes place. And that is simply what Paul is describing. But we're not done yet. There's one more thing. He has described how the resurrection impacts or will impact our future. But remember, believing in the resurrection also needs to impact our life today. It needs to, it should impact our life today. Look at verse 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized, notice, on behalf of the dead? He's asking a question. What do they mean by that? Now, this is really, really interesting, okay? It's really, really interesting. But Paul brings up something that was happening in the church that was kind of weird. Now, the weird part about this is that this is still practiced by Mormons today. So it's kind of interesting. People were being baptized with water on behalf of those who had died. Now, why was this happening? And again, he, he points it, what do mean people mean by doing that? Now, what's so important to understand is that this is unbiblical. Paul does not condone it. Paul does not approve of it. And I want you to understand that Paul says, well, this is why we baptize on behalf of the dead. It's not what he said. He's pointing out that there are people who do that. Now, we think this is strange, but... Let me ask you this question. How many of us came out of religion where we prayed for the dead? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Where we lit candles or whatever it might have been, right? Or we prayed to Mary or we prayed to the saints or whatever it was. We need to understand that there's no such thing as purgatory. It's nowhere found in the Bible, by the way. Once it's over, it's over. We have opportunity while there is breath in our lungs to receive Jesus Christ. But once we die, after death comes judgment. That's it. There's nothing else. But what often happens is, again, you have people that feel sorry for those that have died. And so they try to do something about it. Now, again, the motive we get is out of love. But it's unbiblical. It's unbiblical. So what was happening? Let me give you an idea. Let's pretend you were Greek and you became a Christian. But your mom and dad or grandparents were raised in Greek mythology and they died without Christ. And so what did they do? Well, there's nothing that you can do. You can't pray for them. It's too late. But they came up with this idea. Well, you know what we'll do? We'll be baptized on their behalf. We'll be baptized in proxy, hoping, believing that 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 by being baptized, whatever they are, they'll be forgiven and then allowed to go to heaven or whatever it might be. And so that's what they were doing. Now I want to make something crystal clear. It's unbiblical. Does that make sense? It's unbiblical. How do I know it's unbiblical? Well, two reasons. Number one, we're not saved by water baptism. Does that make sense? We're saved by faith alone, by grace alone, uh, in faith alone, in Christ alone. Very, very simple. It's not of works lest anyone should boast. Water baptism does not save anybody. That's number one. The second thing is that salvation is personal. Isn't that right? It's personal. Each person must make that decision on their own to receive Christ. And if you die in your sin without doing that, it's too late. You are separated from God forever. Now, the reason Paul brings this up is not to approve of what they're doing, but he brings it up to say this. Keep reading the verse. If the dead are not raised at all, why are people being baptized on their behalf? What's he saying? He goes, look it. We know there's a resurrection from the dead. 
We all know and believe Christ rose from the dead. That's why these people are doing that. If they didn't think there was life after death, they wouldn't be getting baptized, trying to save those wherever they are in the afterlife. And Paul's point is, they were doing this with the right heart because they recognize that the resurrection should impact what we do today. Now keep reading. Look what he says, verse 30. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. (laughs) What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? Remember, he's writing this from Ephesus. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now, I love what Paul says because we all, if you're a Christian, we, this is us. The Christian life is hard. And we are in a battle every single day. Do you guys get that? You guys don't even know the stuff that I go through. Physically attacked. Spiritually, mentally, I'm attacked in my dreams. It's nonstop. And sometimes as I feel like the hits keep coming... I want to cry out to God and go, what's next, right? What's next? The battles I face, the nightmares, again, different things that I go through. It's just part of it. And sometimes I wonder, like, why are you allowing me to go through this stuff? Put my wife through everything I put her through. It's hard. But I recognize that God allows me to experience what I experience because as I talk to you guys and you tell me your issues and your problems, I get it. Because I'm in the same boat. Because I am in the same boat. And I'm able to comfort you with the comfort that God comforts me. That's biblical. Now this is important because this is what Paul's saying. Look back. He says, as Christians, we're in danger every hour. He says, I die every day. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about the difficulty and the trial and the attacks of Satan that he went through. But he did it all. What did he say? My pride is in you because of what God has done, because I've been able to share the gospel with you. Now, anyone in here knows, and again, you know, I'm talking about those that are living right, not halfway, not compromising. If you are striving to honor God, to live the way that God has called you to do, it's hard to be a Christian. It's hard. Sometimes, again, I've been a Christian 34 years now. I get tired of fighting. It's hard. I look in the mirror and see the struggles that I face, and it's hard. But it's part of the Christian life. It just comes with the territory, guys, right? What did Jesus say? You guys remember? If, if anyone desires to come after me, and if anyone desires to be one of my disciples, Jesus said, let them, what does he say? Deny himself. The Christian life is a life of denial. You can't do what you want to do anymore because it's not about you anymore. And your your body and your flesh is screaming, feed me, I want that. And you got to fight every single day with yourself. And it gets hard sometimes. You get tired. I'm just telling you the truth. But this is the life that God has called us to do. There are certain things I want to do. There are certain things that my flesh wants and I have to tell myself no. And I recognize, even as a pastor, I can't do certain things. I just can't. I can't. My kids have told me for years, Dad, when are you going to get a new car? When are you going to get a new car? You know what's sad? And this is the truth. If I drove in this parking lot with a brand new car, I wonder how many people would, ooh, look at the pastor. Ooh, he (laughs) he thinks he's fresh in that new car. And I'll be honest. That's why I haven't got one. That's why I... And I recognize it's hard. Oh, I've wanted, since I was like 12 years old, I wanted a BMW. I wanted a BMW. If I drove in here with a BMW, (laughs) you guys would go crazy. You guys would go crazy. So I have to say no. I can't. But it's it's just part of the battle. But this is the Christian life. As we are to what? Take up our cross. What does that mean? We've got to die every day. We can't do what we want to do we got to do what God calls us and commands us to do. And it's hard. But this is the Christian life. What else? Paul said, remember, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, what does he say? You're going to be attacked. The devil's after you. 
You're in his crosshairs. The world hates Christians. It's just part of it. All of this comes with the territory, the trials, the sacrifices, the sufferings. So why do we do it? Why don't we just say forget it? Why do we do it? Well, the reason that we do it is because we know this life is not the end. We know it's worth it. And that is what Paul is saying. All the struggles, everything I've been through, Paul says, I'm not living for this world. I'm living for the next one. And that's why, as Christians, we're willing to deal with all that God has called us to do and to sacrifice and to pay our tithes and to do all these things, even though our flesh doesn't want to, because we know it's worth it. But if there was no afterlife, if this was all there is, what did Paul say? If the dead are not raised, if we're not going to stand before God, if there is no life after death, then you know what? We might as well just party like it's 1999 because nothing else matters. But we don't do that because we know there is something else, because we know the best is yet to come. Now let's wrap it up. Let's look at our last verses, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Don't allow yourself to be lied to. Bad company ruins good morals. Now, why does Paul say this? Well, think about it. You had Christians that believed in the resurrection because they became Christians, but then they started to allow the people they were hanging out with to cause them to doubt the word of God. They did it to themselves. They chose to associate with people that did not believe in the resurrection, and before you know it, they were getting confused. They began to believe it. And Paul says, don't you understand? You you surround yourself with bad company, it's going to ruin you. It's going to affect you. Be careful who you associate with. That's basically what he's saying. And then he says, verse 34, wake up. Wake up from your drunken stupor, from your foolishness, as is the right thing to do, and do not go on sinning. Do you understand when you deny the truth of God's word, you're sinning? When you say, Jesus, I don't think he rose from the dead, you're sinning. Stop listening to these people that don't know God's word, and that's what he says. Look at, this is powerful. For some have no knowledge of God. You know what's such a joke? It's people that don't know God's word and they tell you what to do. What a joke. People that don't know the Bible, and that's the only way you know God, is if you know his word, and yet they're giving Christians advice. What a joke. Look what he says. Look at the last part. I say this to your shame. Paul says you're Christians. And you should know the word of God. You should know the truth. Shame on you for listening to people who don't even know God. It's time to wake up. It's time to open your eyes. It's time to see things for the way that they are so that you believe God's word, so that you stand on God's word and you allow the resurrection or the truth of the resurrection to impact the way you live today. Amen? We'll pick up next week. Let's pray. (coughs) Thank you this morning for your word. Oh, this whole chapter, Lord God, thank you for the, the truth, the evidence, the proof, the implication that you rising from the dead has on all of our lives. We believe it. We stand on it. We look forward to it. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the love that you have for all of us. Lord, we we humble ourselves. We trust in you. Open our eyes. Lord God, help us to be careful to stand on the truth of your word and not allow ourselves to be deceived. There is another life to come. And we need to be living like it. Being prepared for it. Ready for your return. Lord, we love you. We thank you this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.